Beloved, I'm pleased to bring you a sermon this morning that I have entitled The Anatomy of Hate. The Anatomy of Hate. My text is two verses. Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Surely for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. The word of the Lord. The anatomy of hate. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. In my three and a half decades of pastoral ministry. I have consistently heard most people deny that they are haters. Something would happen and I would ask, are you a hater? Me? No, I don't hate anybody. It's very, very rare that somebody would admit that they are a hater. For some reason, most of us are in denial about our hateful dealings with other persons in our lives. I have noticed that most of us are able to do this because we have sinfully and unbiblically defined what hate is. We have trampled on the sixth commandment by maintaining a false definition of hatred. With this study of, of this brief text of Holy Scripture, I hope that we will all adjust our thinking on the matter. So let's study the anatomy, the structure and internal workings of hatred. My premise is that hatred is built and maintained on a profound misunderstanding and rejection of the biblical doctrine of the sanctity of human life. If you misunderstand or reject the biblical doctrine of the sanctity of human life, you are going to hate and you're going to hate people. The mistake that is often made concerning this business of defining hatred is when we assess only the emotional baggage that comes with hatred and then we prematurely decide that we could not be guilty of it for we do not have those intense negative feelings towards others. So we say we're off the hook. Really? Really? You know, this happens when we conclude that if we do not have the acrimony, you know, the, the slander, the outbursts, the violence, the mocking, the defamation, the bitterness, as well as all of the other examples of the negative drama associated with hatred. If we don't have those, then we say we cannot be charged with being haters. We, we therefore refuse to be called haters, but we're dead wrong, and you're going to find out this morning. Dead wrong. Listen to me. Hate is the willful plotting of or welcomed fantasizing about the demise of another human being. Oh, you didn't even hear me. I said hate is the willful plotting of or welcome fantasizing about the demise of another human being. Say, Pastor, could you please explain what all of that means? Let me explain this. This happens when we actively wish for the disappearance from our lives of anyone. Have you wished that anybody disappear from your life? You're a hater. Have you wished for the utter failure of somebody's life? You're a hater. 
By the way, even if they are not aware of it, <laughs> if you're wishing for their disappearance or for their, the failure of their life, you hate them. You hate them. <laughs> we are often only restrained by our inability to execute our secret contempt, considering the obvious consequences that might follow. Let me explain this. Criminal homicide, criminal infanticide, criminal suicide, criminal genocide, or whatever other kind of murder you can think of, occur when we go beyond wishing for the person's demise and utter failure and actually take steps to make sure that it happened. That's when we got into the crime part now. So, hatred is murder begun. And murder is hatred complete. Oh, y'all hearing me? Hatred is what? Murder begun. And murder is hatred complete. So, that's why you're a murderer if you hate people in the eyes of God. My. You just haven't gotten a chance or figured out how to finish half the job. <laughs> Any breach of the sixth commandment, whether it is mental or otherwise, is an abomination in the eyes of God. And he promises to hold all haters and murderers accountable. It is written. We just read it earlier in the service. First John 3, 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Not will be a murderer. Whoever hates his brother is is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him wow the sixth commandment in exodus chapter 20 and verse 13 says you shall not murder king james says thou shalt not kill same thing <laughs> but it was after the flood that we are reading in our text today that it was said <laughs> this was given to Moses long, long this was given to Noah long before it was given to Moses. <laughs> this is why we are looking at this powerful text of Holy Scripture from the days of Noah after the flood. Many of us here have been through a major natural disaster like a hurricane. Anybody here? Everybody here? Everybody? Can we say everybody? We have witnessed. And surveyed the catastrophe and the vastness of the power of God in nature. We saw power like we never saw power before. And we felt small. Talk to me. Yes. Mm, we can't do anything about it. A lot of problems in our life. We say, okay, I can do this. I can do that. Wait, we're going to hunker down and play down Broadway Little House. Huh? We felt the power. We felt the power. And it's in situations like that you, that you tend to think, oh boy, human beings are so small in the vast scheme of things, in the vast cosmos. It was after a tremendous experience like these natural disasters that a person will think, my goodness, human life is nothing. We're small, we're vulnerable. Mm. By the way, it was in such a moment that God suddenly appeared to Noah right after the flood. And in that great deluge, that great flood, God killed everybody on the planet because of sin and only saved eight people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight people. God came to them right then. And you know what they must have been thinking, my? Human life is nothing. But God was so tender and sensitive to them. Right after that massive loss of human life. In our text, he showed up to tell them, listen, I don't want you to misunderstand anything. Human life is the most precious thing on the planet. You are not insignificant. That's what our text is telling us. The Lord God explained what it means to be a human, establishing the basis of our identity, significance, and security. Noah and his family were reassured of their importance. Once they were clear on who they were in the eyes of God, the Lord God explained how they were to treat each other. And that's what we're getting out of our text. They understood the dignity that God had given to each and every human being, as well as the human rights that should follow. You say, Pastor, you're seeing all that in the text? Oh, yes. What we have here 
is the theological principle of the sanctity of human life and the practical implications that flow from it. What is the principle? What is the principle? The principle is that human life has a unique sacredness. Will somebody say sacredness? And you're going to hate if you don't get it. All your hatred come back to this. That you don't get how sacred God views human life. Consider what is being taught in verse 5. If God was expressing his wrath at animals for taking human life. And you, you must remember that animals are only doing instinctive things when they kill a human being. But God, he says, I'm, I will hold even animals accountable for killing human life. How much more accountable are human beings for taking each other's life? Human life is clearly special and unique among all God, God's creatures. Now stay with me. Please do not misunderstand the point. Don't misunderstand me. God loves all of his creation. He loves all of it. He loves everything that he has made. However, it, 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 it's made abundantly clear in this inspired text that God had put human beings in a special category. Human life is sacred. Anyone who violates it will be held accountable by God. Now, what does the word sacred mean? When we say human life is sacred, what does the word sacred mean? This holy text gives us at least three grounds for the sanctity or sacredness of human life. And listen, we all need to hold them very closely to us, very tightly, if, we were going to, if we're going to stop hating one another and stop hating anyone, you know. You're going to continue to be a hater if you don't embrace these principles of the sanctity of human life. Please pay attention, lest you end up in hell because of the unabated and unrepentant hatred in your life. We will look at this under three headings. Number one, inherent ownership. And I base this on verse five. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we must affirm the sanctity or sacredness of human life because every human life is owned by God. Why are we unique? Why are we special? Why is every human being's life sacred? Because it is owned by God. <laughs> this is what it means, what I mean by inherent ownership. Human life does not belong to any human being. It doesn't belong to us simply because that life has been put in our hands. You see, custody is different from ownership. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. What did I just say? Custody is different from ownership. With ownership, we may generally dispose of a thing or treat it as we please. Come on, man. However, with custody come certain fiduciary responsibilities. Are, are y'all with me? Uh, let me illustrate this for you. The money in my bank account. The money that I earn legally is mine to dispose of at my discretion. Uh, can we accept that? Can we accept? If I want to give it away, it's mine to give away. If I want to build something with it, if I want to just leave it there. If I, in other words, I don't really have to answer to anybody about what, what I do with my money that I've legally earned. Hmm? Are, are you all following me? Well, before I go on, let me explain that the money in my account is not sacred. It's not sacred, and I speak only to make a point in the sense that I do not have to account to any other person, human being, about the use of my money. So in that sense, it's not sacred. However, the money that any of you put into my hand, if I am acting, for instance, as your attorney or your investment broker, is money that I can only use at your direction and with your permission. Y'all understand that, right? Now, that money is sacred. Mm, that money is held in trust. By the way, the same applies to the money we put in the offering plate at church. It's held in trust. You can't just do it like with church offerings. Huh? That's why every month we put up before you how the church offerings have been spent. Okay, you understand why we made sacred now. Because a life 
is in our hands does not mean that we can take that life or abuse that life. It does not belong to us. It belongs to God. It is sacred. This is why verse 5 is such a serious and frightening matter. Human life is sacred in the sense we are going to be held accountable for every human life that comes into our lives. And it just doesn't matter what that person's standing or station in the world is. Every human being that you encounter, you're going to be held accountable. You're going to be held to account by God for how you treat that person. We cannot do as we please with any human being. We will answer to the owner, the creator of that life. The God of the Bible values the life of an idiot as well as one who is ingenious. Come on now. <laughs> the God of the Bible values the life of the immoral as well as the immaculate. And by the way, only Jesus is in that last, last category. The God of the Bible values the life of the financially insolvent as well as the financially independent. <laughs> the God of the Bible values the life of the infamous as well as the illustrious. The God of the Bible values the life of those included in his grace as well as those incarcerated in disgrace. Every human life is a sacred deposit. How you treat other people will ultimately face the scrutiny of divine justice. This is because no human being ever really belongs to any other human being. And it really doesn't matter what position they hold. Or their station in life. L listen to me. We do not even belong to ourselves. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said we don't even belong to ourselves. You see, suicide is not amoral in any sense. It is always immoral. We will kill ourselves only to answer to God right after. Suicide will never be acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. For it is written in Psalm number 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We don't belong to ourselves. Because every human life is a sacred deposit. And that such life does not belong to any of us. There is no justification for child abuse. For our children don't belong to us. They belong to God. You're not even hearing me. It is always and will always be reprehensible in the eyes of God if you look down on anyone because of their racial, ethnic, or national origin. For it is written in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And he, that's God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Will somebody say one blood? One blood. All human beings, one blood. He said, but some black, some white, some red. One blood. Somebody say one blood. one blood. Our neighbor, though he or she may be different, does not belong to us. Our neighbor belongs to God. The human life in the womb of an expected mother does not belong to her. With custody come certain fiduciary responsibilities. The baby is in her body. The baby is not a part of her body. Some people say a woman has a right to choose uh, about what she does with her body. Really? We agree with that. We agree with that. We're not talking about her body. We're talking about the body in her body. And if she doesn't think it's a different body, check the DNA. It's different than hers. <laughs> Just make sure that she does not harm the other body inside her body simply because she has custody. With custody comes fiduciary responsibility. Such a mother is a murderer and all who assists her when she aborts the fruit of her womb. The unborn child does not belong to her or anyone. The child belongs to God. Right. Some still don't understand, so let me keep going. There is, there is nothing that will ever mitigate domestic violence. For our spouses do not belong to us. Oh, you're not hearing me. They are on loan to us. Don't hit them. They are loan to us. They belong to God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? <laughs> there is nothing that will justify personal revenge. Oh my, the place is quiet, quiet. I said there is nothing that will justify what? Personal revenge. No matter how horrendously we may have been violated. 
For even the most egregious abuser belongs to God. And it is written in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. <laughs> like Joseph in Genesis 50. You, know, you remember that his brothers, his own brothers treated him so hatefully. Come on, come and talk to me. His brothers, his brothers, his own family hated him. And when now he became the prime minister of Egypt and there before him. They start to tremble when they, under, when they really understand that their little brother that they sold into slavery and were even plotting to kill is now the, the head man in Egypt. Oh, they start to tremble. They started to tremble. They thought, oh my goodness, he's going to get us now. But Joseph was a man of God. And in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 19, he asks a question. He says, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? Brothers, you don't belong to me. I can't take God's place. We must never presumptuously take the prerogatives of God upon ourselves. Listen, it is God's place to pardon or to punish. It's God's place to redeem or to reject. It's God's place to comfort or to condemn. It's God's place to celebrate or to castigate. It's God's place to embrace or to exclude. Are you in the place of God? Number two. Infinite value. Number two is what? I'm looking at the first part of verse six to make this point. Infinite value. Human life is also sacred, not just because God owns it, but because it is essentially priceless. Whoa! What is it? Priceless. Why is it priceless? It is, for instance, like a symbol that memorializes a cherished loved one, you know? I am sure that you have these symbols, whether the loved one is alive or dead. But I'm at, whatever the symbol is, whether it's a ring or a picture or whatever, whatever the, a quantitative value should not be put on it. If you're doing a valuation, if the ring was given to you by someone that you cherish and is special to you, $5,000 won't cut it. As a matter of fact, no price will cut it. You see what I'm saying? Because essentially, that symbol has sentimental value, qualitative value. You can't quantify <laughs> a price for that. There is a mysterious and inexplicable connection between the lover and the loved one that creates a violent stubbornness against the whole notion of parting with this symbol. There is no exchange for it. Nothing can be exchanged for it. What am I saying? What am I saying? Human life has infinite value. Now, I must admit that when you read verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. It sounds awfully like a bloodthirsty reaction, doesn't it? Huh? It sounds bloodthirsty. The vengeance here sounds primitive and uncivilized and maybe even irrational. But hold on a minute, not so fast, not so fast. If we are able to get past our visceral, sinful myopia, we will see <laughs> that it is actually one of the first great affirmations of the dignity of every human being on the planet. You say, Pastor, what? Yes, 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 yes. What the Lord God is affirming here is that there is absolutely nothing that can pay for a human life but human life. Whoa! By the way, to get our life, get our life paid for, Eternally, it took a human, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, an infinite human. <laughs> but even in a temporal sense, there is nothing that you can do to, to come up with a value on a human life but another human life. If you're going to take human life, you're going to give up your life. That's what God said. Huh? <laughs> of course, there are people in our generation who believe that they're more merciful than God, but they're really stupid. They don't realize they're devaluing human life. Just recently in the news, we heard somebody kill somebody. And they're getting 11 years. A human life is worth 11 years? Huh? Lord have mercy. 
That is an abomination. Human life is so priceless that there is nothing, nothing else in all of reality but human life that can be exchanged for it. Whether one offers money, you know, being fine, or time, being confined, when one offers these as payment for human life, you will only mock the life and strip it of its inherent dignity. The life is cheapened by assigning it a final, a, a finite value. This, this is what made the Atlantic slave trade of our African forefathers so reprehensible, you know. Human beings were being valued like hogs and cattle by both the sellers and the purchasers. Hmm? <laughs> That's what made, how do you put financial value on a human being. The Lord God was saying in this holy text that human beings were created by him with infinite value and that any currency or finite valuation, any quantitative measurement of value only blasphemes the creator and mocks his glorious creation. The God of the Bible was making it abundantly clear that it really does not matter who you are. Every human individual life is priceless. One's socioeconomic condition, one's ethnic origin, one's mental aptitude, one's age, one's stage of development, one's physical characteristics, one's gender, one's moral history, one's criminal record. None of these things are determinants of the value of a human life. The life is priceless. Human beings do not have value or lack value because of their pedigree or their choices. Our value comes from our maker and his holy purposes. Human life is sacred because it has infinite value. The God of the Bible is saying that there is literally nothing more value than a human life, more valuable than a human life. We quoted earlier Romans. 12 verse 19 where it says vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord you know God repays in many ways but he often repays to the magistrate as a matter of fact God has only permitted the magistrate of the state to administer capital punishment nobody else mm. Mm. and this must only be in the pursuit of divine justice Mm, so the magistrate can get in trouble with God. Okay, please understand. This was not necessarily instituted as a deterrence of murder, even though it is. What the Lord had in mind was justice. Oh, y'all not even hearing me. The, the, uh, capital punishment deters murder. But that's not what God was aiming at. He was aiming at justice. God established capital punishment administered by the state. And definitely not administered by the mob or by individual vigilantes. No, 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 no. Administered by the state. And it is only because this is the temporal balancing of the scales. Will somebody say balance scales? The only way you're going to balance the scales is a life for a life. That's God's way. Hmm? <laughs> only a life for a life brings temporal justice. On those who maliciously take human life. The Apostle Paul wrote about the magistrate, you know, the magistrate in the state in Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. What did he say about the magistrate? He says, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear what? The sword in vain. For he is what? God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. This is God using the state as his instrument, taking a life that only he, as divine proprietor and owner, has the right to take in pursuit of his justice. <laughs> My question to you this morning is, what have you made more important than another person's humanity? Uh, you, you heard the question? What have you made more important than another person's humanity? Let me put it this way. Just what is so important that you must destroy somebody to get whatever you want? Haven't you put a price on them? And God has given them infinite value? Hmm? 
Oh, may God grant us all the grace to love as he loved and to care as he cared. But I personally know that he cares. Does anybody else here know he cares? He does care. You see, in loving kindness, Jesus came. I'll do it again. <laughs> My soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of what? Sin and shame. Through grace, he lifted me. Oh my goodness. From sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name. He lifted. I know he cares. Oh, God, make me care like you care. Number three, image bearers. Image bearers. And we base this on the second part of verse six. Hmm? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the most important reason why we must affirm the sanctity of human life. This is the most important reason. Every human being is created in the image of God. This is the reason why we're not supposed to hate anybody or take anybody out. Every human being. Will somebody say every? <laughs> in Latin, we call it the imago Dei. Hmm? Referring to what is written in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, which we all know. Hmm? God created us in his image. But it is prominently, prominently um, declared right here in our text, in the last part of verse 6, where it says what? For in the image of God, he made man. Hmm? Verse 6 of our text. This means that divine glory rests on every human being. God has put his stamp on every human being. God has put his sign of ownership on us from embryonic conception to eternal consummation. Every time we violate another human being, whether the victim is aware of the violation or not, whether it's physical, emotional, relational, or spiritual, we are attacking, we are assaulting the very image of God in them. Violating another human being is spitting on and profaning the very reflection and glory of God in that person. God takes it seriously. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God, forgive us. We're all guilty in here. All of us in here. To be in the image of God means that God made every human being both to be reflectors or mirrors of himself with unique and special value and a matter that no other aspect of his creation can share. Of course, other aspects of God's creation do reflect his glory to some degree. Because we, we've read in Psalm number 19 and verse 1, the heavens what? Declare the glory of God and the firmament what? Shows his handiwork. So the beauty and the symmetry and the diversity and the complexity and the majesty of the natural world scream out that its great design demands a great designer. Okay, we are there. It is also asserted in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 that we all intimately and viscerally have knowledge of our creator's handiwork even though our sin and moral corruption causes us to suppress that knowledge. You know, we'd be just pretending because we all know looking at the world around us that there is God and we will have to deal with him. I will, I'll, I'll explain that a little later. The whole point is that as compelling as the natural world is in reflecting the glory of God, each human being is the finite epitome of God's image. Of course, faithful stewardship of our environment and of the animals is a biblical mandate. We must do that. However, God has only held out this high accountability for what we do with human life. For any violation of our fellow man, whether it is incremental or ultimate, in assaulting the sixth commandment. You know, there's something about us that reflects God's glory in a peculiar way that no other created thing can reflect God's glory. So let's interrogate ourselves to unpack it because some of you may not understand how unique we are in the eyes of God when he says he's, we are created in his image. Let me ask you a question. Why are we so much more unhappy than animals? 
Well, it's obvious that they have simpler structures and needs. But so let's dig a little deeper. Okay? Let me ask you another question. Why do we want more love than we can ever get? <laughs> Why are we so frustrated in our desire to create things? Because everybody wants to feel like their life is worth something, so we want to create. We want to create. We want to be productive on the job so they'll promote us. We want to see that our children become something. We want to build something. Come on, talk to me. We want to do something with our life. We want to help something. Huh? Why is it that that is constantly on our minds? I cannot prove to be useless. Some of you don't get it. Okay, let me, let me, let me put it like this. Because I am going somewhere. Okay? Let me put it like this. Have you noticed that it is just when we get the hang of our job, just when we get the hang of our career, just when we have the confidence of experience and the wisdom of age that the notice comes that it's time to retire. Frustrating, isn't it? Okay, you see where we're going? Some of you still don't see where we're going. Okay, let me use this one. When we have worked out at the gym or even at home for years to stay trim and fit, and when we are beginning to see some semblance of physical fitness, what happened? What happened? Entropy kicks in and our bodies rapidly feel the pangs of inevitable deterioration. Hmm? We thought, finally, I'm looking buff. <laughs> and then why? Everything's down to go south. Okay, 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 okay. Maybe I need to ask the question another way. Why is it that we want beauty and we never have enough of it? Why is it that we want love and we never get it? Why is it that we always seem to have some higher standards than we are achieving? Why are we so unhappy? Why, why are our desires insatiable? We want a joy. We want a love. We want a beauty. We want a creativity. But the world does not afford us. Why? Why are we unhappy? We can take it a little further, you know. Why do we hate death so much? Okay, now, you know, many in this world try to convince themselves that there is no God. And Psalm number 14, verse 1 tells us they're fools, but let's not go there right now. Hmm? They try to convince themselves that there is no God and that this world as we know it is all there is. Okay, well, let's humor them for a while. If they are right, why do they still fear death? You're not supposed to fear death if there is nothing on the other side. Hmm? You're not supposed to fear death if not God there. But because viscerally and deep down inside, God put it in you that he is there. Read Romans 1. <laughs> That's why you're, you're afraid to die. Because you jolly well know you will meet your maker and you have to answer to him. Wow, wow. You're afraid of death. There should be nothing more natural than death. Animals don't fear death. They just fear pain. Hmm? Listen to me. Human beings fear death because they are created in the image of God. We all have that complex structure by which we can reflect things that the natural world cannot reflect. Even though the image of God in us has been somewhat defaced by our sin, it has not been erased because every human being finitely reflects God's rationality, God's personality, God's eternity, God's creativity. The natural world cannot do that because it was not made to do that. Say, Pastor, I still don't understand where you're going. Let me ask you this one. Maybe this will help you. Why is it that our children... Even though they're tired as can be enough, they're not in. Why do they want to go to bed? Come on, come on, come on, talk to me. Okay, don't bother the children. What about you when you were a child? Why you didn't want to go to bed? Why you, what, you're not in enough? And your parents say, go to I'm not sleepy. <laughs> Why is it? They always seem to want to squeeze a little bit more life and living out of the day. They just cannot get enough of whatever they think is going on or whatever they think they're about to miss. So they don't want to go to sleep. By the way, some adults right now have that problem too. They can't go to sleep. They don't want to go to sleep because something they're going to miss. Maybe on the TV. I don't know. 
Why? This is why adults ridiculously put in the overtime continually. Hello? This is why we often take abuse from others because we're holding out that maybe tomorrow things will be better. Hmm? Listen to me. Because we are rational beings, we hunger to know more. Because we are personal beings, we hunger to love more. Because we are eternal beings, we hunger for that which will last forever. We want everything to last. We want our bodies to last. We want our hopes to last. We want the car to last. We want everything to last. But, we, but please understand, it will not last because it's finite. But why do we want it to last? Because there is eternity in us. We are created in the image of God. This is why we rage against the dying of the light. Human beings and human beings alone are mirrors of God. This is a great blessing, but it is also the reason why we are never going to be satisfied with anything that is not eternal. We're never going to be satisfied. We will always be hungry for more. But we will never find it in finite pursuits. We will only find it in matters of infinite value. The Apostle Paul wrote about this, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18 when he said, While we do not look at the things which are seen, <laughs> but at the things which are what? Not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal, temporal or temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Listen, folks, we were built to reflect God. We were built as mirrors to face God. A mirror reflects what it is before. We have to face God to reflect God. Hmm? Come on now. This is the power and majesty of the Imago Dei. All of our unhappiness in life, and y'all listen to me, all of our unhappiness in life comes when we are reflecting anything other than the true and living God. When we are not facing God, we have something else before us. And whatever is before us is what we reflect. A mirror faced toward the sun will blind you with brilliance. But a mirror facing darkness will only reflect darkness. The problem is not with the capacity and design of the mirror. There is something radically wrong with the use and direction of the mirror. It can only reflect what's in front of it. Every human being still has the capacity for rationality, for personality, for eternity, for creativity. However, unregenerate humanity is completely faced towards the darkness and, on, and therefore they are on a trajectory to perdition. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, ignorance of or a misunderstanding of what it means to be created in the image of God is at the root of us never really understanding ourselves. This is why we're so unhappy. If we do not grasp this theological issue, we will prematurely settle for something stupid like the shallow and empty psychotherapeutic assessment of our unhappiness. We will imagine that we are just maladjusted and we need a therapist when in fact we're clearly sinful and need a savior. Are y'all hearing me? The doctrine of the Imago Dei exposes a void in us that can only be filled by the true and living God. Any and all other idolatrous substitutes will only delay true and lasting happiness and frustrate our lives with stress and worry. Only the true and living God should be reflected in our mirrors. <laughs> Believing that all human beings are created in the image of God is essential to civil and responsible social interaction. This is how we're going to get along with one another. This is the only principle that gives us a basis for affirming that we will not trample on one another. This is the only principle that gives us dignity and value that we're created in God's image. Let me explain something to you. Atheism and evolution. Yeah, basically the same thing. Hmm? Atheistic. Atheism and evolution makes all of us randomly originate from nothing. Some primordial soup. Okay? We randomly originate from nothing, and then it, they put us on a trajectory to infinite nothingness. Because nothing else is there. Okay? So, we are reduced to just a collection of chemicals that come together with no purpose and merge into ultimate chaos with no purpose. So, they're taking us from nothing to nothing. Are y'all following me? <laughs> With such a worldview, civil rights and justice are therefore not inalienable, but just arbitrary constructions that can be changed by whoever currently holds the power. 
Hmm? We become just another group of animals fighting for survival without a rationale for why we even want to win the fight. Because <laughs> we're going to end up where? Nothing. Nothing. All who deny the existence of the God of the Bible and the reality of the doctrine of the Imago Dei are deluded hypocrites. You say, Pastor, why would you call them hypocrites? Because their position strips human beings of their dignity, even while they make self-righteous demands for moral change and justice in society. I want you to understand something, my brethren. Hmm? You can't have it both ways. You can't say you don't believe in God and still you want justice. Let me summarize it for you. If there is no God, there is no author for reality. Come on now. Hmm? Don't forget the scripture tells us he is the what? Author and finisher. If there is no God, there is no author. And if there is no author, there is no authority. Come on, stay with me now. Hmm? Oh, you didn't know the relationship? The author is the authority. If there is no God, there is no author to reality. If there is no author, there is no authority. And if there is no authority, there is nothing that is called right and wrong. And if there is no basis for morality and ethics, then all demands for moral change and justice are vain, futile, and illogical. It is only the God of the Bible that gives us the dignity of the Imago Dei. Giving us an enduring identity and significance and security. If we follow on biblical thinking and get rid of God. If we abandon the idea that his ownership of us uh, uh, is real. And uh, if we reject the doctrine of our creation in the image of God. We eventually only end up just using and abusing each other. For we would have catastrophically concluded that there is no sacredness. To human life. Let me wrap this up. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I wrap this up by asking you a question, and I hope you can get it this today. Don't miss this. Okay? Are we being careful about honoring and valuing everyone we encounter? <laughs> everyone? The primary application of the sixth commandment is that everyone who comes into our world must feel honored and valued. Will somebody say everyone? Every. Every human life must feel honored and valued. Oh God, please forgive me. Please forgive us. Listen to me. Every person that we encounter must feel that we take them seriously. But we only take seriously certain, certain favored people, you know? Right. What family you belong to? Where you live? What job you have? Huh? Mm. we are breaking the sixth commandment when we treat people with indifference or flippancy or superiority or presumption or coldness does everybody who comes into our orbit sense that we are treating them with dignity with warmth and with seriousness somebody say pastor some of them are not worthy of it oh really are you worthy <laughs> you are worthy I guarantee you that everything you accuse people of you have done Either in thought, word, or deed, and your God has seen it all. Somebody's not devalued because they mess up. Huh? Even if we fundamentally disagree with them and reject their views, which we are allowed to do, by the way, when they are finished talking to us, do they still feel like their dignity is intact? Do they sense that we truly have their best interests at heart? That we really care about them. Do they feel that we truly love them? And that we're not, we're not just trying to peddle our ways. Whether they are material ways or philosophical ways. Do they feel our warmth even when they know that we disagree with them? We can disagree. We can disagree and still love. Okay. I think you sense now that we need a radical paradigm shift in our thinking this morning. Hmm? Because you came here thinking I'm no hater, but now you know the truth. Listen to me. We must immediately adjust ourselves to the notion that there are no ordinary people. Oh, 
all human beings have dignity. Yes, many of them have proper problems. They may be misguided. They may be corrupt to the core. But their spiritual condition does not address their value as human beings. They are no ordinary people. Yeah, you all hearing me? We must disagree and refute the nonsense in our culture. But we must do so in the context of the love of Christ. We must clearly communicate that a person's nonsense does not turn them into nothing. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said a person's nonsense does not turn them into nothing. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive us. Our love for every human being must be a real love, a costly love, a love that has a deep and strong rejection of anything sinful, but also coupled with a compassionate and caring concern for the sinner. Okay. We will never get any enduring assurance that we are truly a part of the family of God, that we are truly saved, if we are not just overflowing with the love of Christ. Did you hear me? You want assurance that you are saved? Are you overflowing with the love of Christ? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is what? Born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God. But he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Boy, that passage says it all, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Listen, folks, we need to give evidence. Hello? What do we need to give? We need to give evidence that the active and passive obedience of Christ has been applied to us personally. If you are determined to jettison the hate that remains in your heart and consistently prove with the aid of the Holy Spirit that your life is characterized by the love of Christ, you will have real evidence that Christ has indeed lived the perfect life for you that you should have lived and that he has also died the ultimate death for you that you should have died. You will have evidence that indeed you're really saved. But apart from this love of Christ in you, if you don't have any evidence of it, give yourself no assurance of salvation. Amen. Listen to me. It's not complicated. I know I took quite a while to make these points, but it's not complicated. You heard me? Yes. Let me tell you how it works. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, our Lord Jesus explained what's going to happen on the judgment day. It, on the judgment day, there's going to be a great separation between the redeemed and the reprobate. But don't think that's complicated. It's as simple as this. The separation will be between the lovers and the haters. Oh, you said, Pastor, is that simple? Oh, yes, but of course, you've got to define love and hate the way God does. The great separation on the judgment day will be between the lovers and the haters. You see, God's love is not a mere abstraction to be debated and studied. It is tangible. It is palpable in every way. Listen to me. You're going to be in big trouble on the judgment day if he says to you, I was sick and you didn't visit me. You're in big trouble if he says to you, I was in prison and you didn't visit me. You're in big trouble if on the judgment day he says to you, I was homeless and you didn't shelter me. You're in big trouble if he says, I was hungry, but you didn't feed me. <laughs> I was naked, but you didn't clothe me. You're in big trouble if, he's, if he says, I was going crazy. And you didn't counsel me. I was not in your circle, and you didn't welcome me. Please. So all the self-righteous people who love to look down on everybody will ask, Lord, when? When? When, Lord, did we treat you so badly? When did we treat you so badly? Matthew chapter 25, verse 45. Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch 
as you did not do it to the to one of the least of these you did not do it to me make up your mind are you going to be playing games with your life or are you going to get serious with your God listen following Christ could never be about tolerating hate or coddling the haters for he made it upon to declare that he is the epitome of love it was love that made him announce in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. It was love that made him announce he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. It was love that made him announce that he came to proclaim liberty to the captives. It was love that made him proclaim and announce that he came to proclaim recovery of sight to the it was love that made him say to all, I've come to set at liberty those who are oppressed. It was love that made him announce that he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Oh, Jesus, lover of my soul, please give me your love. Please change me. Please change all of us and make us lovers and not haters. Amen.